quick brown fox jump over the lazy dog. It's where we all begin. Welcome to Lazy Dog Typewriters. Great white sharks descended from Megalodon prowl the ocean in search of prey, constantly swimming, sensing the slightest disturbance in the tiniest drop of blood. Even a mile away in the ocean, truly, nature has engineered a perfect machine. Not unlike these great white typewriters, which you are about to see. Sit right back, and you'll hear a tale. Set sail with us, and you'll see today, Famous Typewriters 3, Famous Typewriters 3. Join us on a three-hour tour. A three-hour tour. Okay, okay. A ten-minute tour. But sit back and enjoy anyway. Great. White typewriters. Howdy folks, Lazy Dog Typewriters here. Kevin and Katie like to watch videos on YouTube about a game called Feed and Grow Fish, where the goal is to become the alpha predator in an ocean full of opponents. Look at this table filled with great white typewriters which prowled the oceans from the 1960s competing with anyone and everything, I can see that we're going to need a bigger boat. Make that table. Was the ocean big enough for all these typewriters to survive? Who was the alpha predator? Let's take a look. We have the Smith Corona Corsair 700. Now many of you are probably familiar with the Corsair, but the Corsair 700 is a much rarer fish in the sea. Not too many of them uh, were made and they're kind of a rare catch. Right in the middle of a great wave of sea label typewriters from Smith Corona and Sears, the Constellation, the Celebrity, Citation, Cutlass, all these names sound like aircraft carriers to me. Definitely some nautical thinking going on at Smith and Sears during this time frame. So, the 700 is the evolution of the Corsair probably feeling pressure from Japanese imports. They added the power space, which the Japanese called the automatic spacer, and you'll see that in action. This is a very satisfying <laughs> effect for the kids and for anyone on a manual typewriter. It makes you feel like you actually have an electric, but you don't. It's just some good engineering. And that feature was showing up on some of the brothers and other Japanese typewriters. I believe they even patented it, so I'm not quite sure how Smith Corona pulled off uh, putting it in there other than changing the name which uh, isn't much of a change but in any case it's a neat add-on feature also different from most Corsairs is this machine um, has a two-tone coloration and it has an additional layer on the front which is um, I guess a plastic material I'm not sure exactly what it's made of you have a smooth plastic and then you have this plastic you have the label is on the front now and of course it still says Corsair and Corsair 700 on the back the keyboard layout remains unchanged with the exception I don't believe the standard Corsair and I'll come up so you can see this has a D jammer key which also serves as a backspace key standard tab you've got your three position switch for red color selector stencil and black you have the error control which essentially allows you to do a half space when you hold it down and it'll allow you to type uh, and fit a word in after you erased already the previous correction you might have made. It doesn't actually do corrections itself, but it allows you to squeeze a word, say a six character word, into a space where you maybe only had five before. Um, it's a nice little feature. Just going over the standard features you see, your carriage return arm, you've only got a single and a double spacing option, your uh, tabs, correction, your margins are set here with these sliders, and you've got some nice rabbit ear paper support. Carriage release arm on the right and your paper tension release over here. Beneath the hood on the Corsair 700 you can see a pretty standard basket. It's a carriage shift machine but a very lightweight one, very light to the touch. You'll notice if you look carefully that you have non-standard sized ribbon spools. Uh, those are a little over an inch and a half and you have to use the uh, proprietary ribbon spools with your Corsairs. You can of course put standard width ribbon in but less of it because these ribbon spools don't hold as much as a standard two inch ribbon spool. 
And these ribbon spools use a mechanism where they have a slot that you won't be able to see, but there's a slot in the ribbon spindle which matches up with a, a little tooth uh, in the ribbon itself. And of course, it's hard to do left-handed and one-handed through a camera, but that will slide back through, there we go, uh, onto your ribbon spindle and you'll be in business. Checking out the quick overview of the Corsair 700. Like I mentioned, it has a standard early 1960s keyboard layout, which means it is lacking a dedicated number one. So Kevin, if you want to write number one with this machine, how do you do it? The lowercase L. That's right, and the exclamation point is made how? By putting a period, backspace, then uh, this... Apostrophe, that's right. Yep, we got it all down. Thanks so much. All of the Corsairs were made for a specific purpose. They were dedicated towards reducing cost and competing with the Japanese imports, which were beginning to really take over uh, the typewriter ecosystem. So you see the features that they introduced from the Japanese with the power space. You see their desperate efforts to reduce costs by using plastic and other less costly materials. So many people malign the Corsair for that, but if you understand what the purpose of this this device is, is to deliver a very lightweight, very portable machine at a specific price point, I think they delivered pretty well. And in my mind, the Corsair 700 really, this particular example, it's just a gorgeous white, great white color scheme with the turquoise. One other surprise feature that this machine has is a much different case. And I'm going to zoom out just for a second and give you an overview of that. So instead of having an integrated clamshell case as the normal Corsairs do, this has an attache case. And in fact, Sears manufactured a model, sorry, Sears marketed a model of this called the attache. And what's so slick about this is it's about half the size of your traditional uh, Smith Corona case, but it has all the features. It has some really neat uh, engineering back here. These little uh, wedge pieces will lock into your typewriter, just, just directly and gracefully fit right on top of the lower case of the Corsair 700. And you have this wonderful hinge, which is a locking hinge. Again, hard for me to do left-handed, one-handed. But it gives you just a very slick, very professional and business-like case that you can use for uh, carrying your, your typewriter. And it's aluminum, it's much stronger than the plastic cases would be. So it's interesting that you have such a pretty, you would think, uh, decorated, sort of maybe perhaps aimed at the female marketplace, if I may say so, uh, model, but then it comes back contrasted with a, uh, a very business, all business attache case, which is definitely meant, I think, for travel. So it's a really interesting, uh, really neat typewriter. Uh, let's give a comparison to some other great whites swimming in that same competitive ocean. We're going to take a look now at the Sears Citation 2. All right, we'd be lost at sea if we didn't praise the Citation 2. It was built by Smith Corona for Sears only in 1966. It had a retail price of about $90 when they released it. It came out in the spring of 66, and by the fall of 66, they had moved on. Um, it's just a really gorgeous machine. This is right when Smith Corona was at the peak of its production. So uh, it has all the bells and whistles, if you will, from the Smith Corona line, uh, including, as we come around, give you an overview, some neat features like a, par a dedicated paragraph key, which will indent the typewriter as you're typing along. So you just hit this paragraph, and now you've got a paragraph indentation. Pretty slick. It also acts as a little baby tab, too, I guess, if you want to use it that way. Your tabs are set and cleared here right on the front. You've got your tab button. This very noticeable red Change of type key is also there. This was introduced later on. Some of the other C models in the C of typewriters they produced at this time had two change of types. And I think they were trying to differentiate a little bit with that. So here we have a dedicated one exclamation point, which isn't seen on the Corsair. And uh, the later also competing ones from Sears and also Smith Corona, some of them had twin change of type keys. But we just have one here. It has a touch control on the front. And I wish this, I hope this comes out. I'll try to zoom in for you. It's such a pretty contrast of colors. You've got a very beautiful white, then you've got the red change of type, and then we'll zoom in, and maybe you can make that out, but that is a very pretty uh, blue. Not unlike the shark, we have our Lego shark in the back. Uh, we'll unzoom. You can take a look at everything, but yes, it matches perfectly. It looks like a Lego piece. It's translucent, not transparent, but translucent blue, and it uh, really is one of my, I don't know why I like it so much, but I, I really do like it. That's something very distinctive. Other citations 
uh, the Citation 1 and other models of similar, the Citation 88 is another model very similar, uh, they have a red ball, solid red ball, not translucent. So it really is the epitome of the Smith Corona uh, manufacturing at the time. It's a very nice, wide, very comfortable space bar, nice styling. You've got some nice bevel cuts. It just really looks good. Very nice opening hood. I'll go ahead and feed some paper in real quick. You've got your standard um, sliding tab margins. You've got your paper release. You've got your paper bale and tray, which can be opened up, your eraser tray. Uh, your uh, line selector over here, you've got two, one and a half, and single. I like this one and a half is my favorite spot. This machine came to us in really good shape with the exception just a couple of little idiot marks, as you call them, where someone had the lid up and then they moved, bam, the carriage return over and it smacked right there. Almost any typer that has been used has those kind of love handles. Um, but other than that, wow, this machine uh, is in really good shape and it was shipped to us upside down and unsecured in its case from the seller we bought it from and <laughs> it arrived unscathed. So it's kind of a great white whale in that respect too. Very elusive and hard to catch or hard to damage. Any case, let's uh, feed in some paper, give a quick typing test. I neglected to do that on the Corsair, maybe Time Warp will let us go back and fix that. Let's feed our paper in. This happens to be some really nice bond paper. And we'll do our favorite sentence here. Quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. All right, and this one looks like I missed the J. I'm not the best typist. So just a standard Pika, Pika and or Pika font, a very legible, um, very quick. I think that's 12 CPI right there. Just a great all around machine, all around American, wonderful machine uh, competing in that ocean again with the Japanese typewriters competing to make a price point. Um, and interesting because it was only around for one year. So the Sears Citation 2 also, uh, for you calligraphy fans, they really went all out on the C here. <laughs> I, can, I can hardly see it without my reading glasses, but it's a very ornate, swirly C, and I'm not sure why they did that, but uh, it, it is another little cool oddity about this typewriter, one that I really enjoy. Next we have perhaps the most formal of our trio of typewriters, and that is the Underwood 450, which looks to me like nothing if not James Bond uh, in Dr. No, perhaps, uh, or like something was just leapt out of the Mediterranean uh, Mediterranean Sea onto the beaches of Cannes or maybe Rome or Sicily. Rome's not right on the shore, but uh, something just came out of the ocean, really pe beautiful, dressed for dinner. Uh, it breaks our shark metaphor, but my son thinks it looks like a panda, keeps calling it the panda typewriter. So very formal, not made in China, but instead made by Underwood, designed by an American in uh, New York, working for a company called Nelson & Company, a design company. His name was John Svezia, and I'm sure I messed that up. But uh, he was part of this Nelson design group, which I guess is something reminiscent of Gia or some very Mad Men era. And I'll just give you a chance to soak this in. This was made in Spain, designed in the United States, made by Underwood. And if you are familiar at all with the Olivetti uh, Studio 45, you can see that this is pretty much a predecessor of it, almost a direct, well, very much a direct predecessor even to the name. So the Underwood 450, Studio 45. Under the hood here, you essentially have a Laterra 22 or 32 mechanism, all the same. You've got the distinctive uh, Olivetti uh, red tab key. So just a great machine. We just got this in a few minutes ago, actually. I haven't even cleaned it, so if it does look dirty, I apologize. It's not showing itself at its true best. But man, I love this typewriter. Uh, it is so pretty, so uh, classic, and it's just an inst instant permanent collection for us. So as I mentioned, um, all the internals and fundamentals of the Latera series and, and an Underwood branded uh, machine, it's kind of the first machine that was really distinctively different for Underwood for about five or six years when they first made it. And uh, Robert Messinger gives a really nice overview of this design, this comparison to the Studio 45 uh, and you can go and look these up because we are trying to get you out of here in 10 minutes instead of a three hour tour. You've got your standard uh, ribbon caps here. It is a uh, basket shift, so very lightweight, easy on the fingers. Your standard mechanism here for the Olivetti's, which is this very nifty, uh, refined, if you will, fold out carriage arm, but make sure you put that back before you uh, put it away. And you can see that over time there's another little ding. I don't know how you would avoid that other than putting a plastic wrap on the end of your carriage. 
I think that these paper supports are real nifty here because you lift up and you're like, well, something's not right. Ah, and then it pulls up your second one, making your V. I thought at first, well, maybe, gosh, you got bent. It's not in perfect shape anymore, but lo and behold, working as designed. Okay, let's give a quick typing test just to give you a sense of what this is all about. I don't even really want to show you the impression because this is probably a three decade old ribbon, but I'll give you a chance to take it out anyway. Um, very faint, but a clear impression. We'll zoom in. And as I mentioned, this just, just came to us moments ago. So we had the opportunity to make a trio of typewriters and a trio of great white typewriters. I would describe this as uh, identical to the Latera 32, obviously, because it is basically a Latera 32 under the hood, but very solid, very um, uh, smooth typewriter. Uh, the Corsair would be the least uh, robust feeling. It has a lightweight, uh, I wouldn't say flimsy, but definitely cheaper feel to it. Uh, the Citation 2 is a wonderful, uh, trying to make a car analogy, but just a wonderful sedan from the mid 60s. A cat, not quite a Cadillac maybe, but uh, just a really good Lincoln, you know, we'll say something like that. And then the Underwood 450, which was kind of designed less as a, certainly not an ultra portable like the Corsair 700 was, but sort of an in-between, a portable and maybe just a little bit bigger. Even though it's lightweight with a plastic, it is a little bit heavier. Um, it's the heaviest one of them all. So again, if we're stack raking in just a quick, uh, quick way, I would conclude this uh, review. Each typewriter has its own pros and cons. For me, all three of them are glorious, white, beautiful machines. The Corsair 700 has a beautiful teal, has a wonderful attache case. The case really gets me excited. The Corsair 2 is just an all-around sweet spot for me. It's a gorgeous design. It has all the features which I would need. Only thing I could kind of miss maybe is an automatic spacer, which the Ultra Portable one has, um, but which isn't a deal breaker. And I love um, just the little touches, the styling differences, the blue, uh, touch control lever, things like that. And then finally we have the Underwood 450, which again for me is another great white typewriter. It has a very formal but beautiful look uh, with the white and the black. Not a combination you see very often. Uh, when I saw it, I never heard of it before and I just had to have it. Um, I think it's an absolutely gorgeous machine, very formal. If I will, uh, James Bond, like I said, Dr. No, James Bond, uh, it's his typewriter perhaps. Thank you so much for watching us. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to JK Brickworks, which is the designer and the website of this Lego creation. The Shark model uh, is the uh, most recent Sea Life 3-in-1 creator the kids love. But he designed a really awesome base and mechanized uh, motion process for it. And we hooked it up to a motor. And we'll let you go out taking a look at the shark swimming amidst these great white typewriters. Thanks again. Mama Sharky doo 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 Mama Sharky doo 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 Mama Sharky doo doo Mama Shark Daddy Shark doo 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 Daddy Shark doo 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 Daddy Shark Grandpa Shark do 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 Grandpa Shark do 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 Grandpa Shark do 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 Grandpa Shark That's all I know do 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 Gotta go do 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 Gotta go do 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 See you later Please like, subscribe, and share